There are some statements that only God can say. John 15, 4-5 Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches, he who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Some things in this life are meant to be the way they are. There is no way around them. An example is a car. You cannot expect a car to work or move without the engine. Even the electric cars we have now, they use batteries, and they still have engines. There are things that will make a car work. If you take these things out, there is no way the car can work. Without oxygen, a person cannot breathe. Without water, we cannot survive. But the Bible tells us something about God. The Bible tells us without God, we can do nothing. My friend, my point today is that everything physical that you know, everything that you see, everything that you are conscious of and that you know was created by an invisible spirit being, God Almighty. He spoke it all into existence. My friend, we need God. Whether you like it or not, this world, our society needs God. When we wake up in the morning, we need God. When we go to sleep at night, we need God. The Lord Jesus Christ said, without me, you can do nothing. You are not the captain of your life. You are not in control. You need God more than you will ever know. Nothing outside of God can exist. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Without God, you cannot, you cannot do anything. Nothing can live without God. You can't breathe without God. Your heart cannot beat without God. The whole universe cannot exist without. We need the Almighty God that is from everlasting to everlasting. The remarkable thing about this is when you understand this, when you understand that you cannot do anything without God, you don't turn to a pastor. You don't turn to a religion. You don't turn to a doctor. You don't turn to a psychologist. You turn to Jesus. He is the answer to your question. He is the solution to your problem. He is the shelter in your storm. He is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. He is the breath to your lungs. Jesus, the King of Kings. Jesus, the only begotten Son, our Lord. Jesus, the only way to heaven. Jesus, the Alpha and the Omega. Jesus, the soon coming King. Jesus, if you are in trouble, Cry out to him. If you need salvation, tell him what you want. For without me, you can do nothing. There is nothing you can do without God. Your willpower cannot help you breathe. Your willpower can't push air into your lungs. Your willpower cannot push blood throughout your body. When you are asleep at night, your willpower is not watching over you. You are not in control. We need Him, my friend. In your marriage, you need Him. In your place of work, you need Him. Driving your car, Passing that exam, we need him. 
Humble yourself today and realize that in every aspect of your life we need God. He is watching over everyone at every moment every day. He is abundant in resources. You cannot exhaust the resources of God. He has control over every animal in the air. He can feed with ravens just like he did with Elijah. He has control over every animal on land. He can call all the animals across the world two by two just like he did for Noah. He has control over every animal in the sea. He can keep you in the belly of the well for three days. All the fish of the sea obey the command of the Lord. He can separate the Red Sea. He can make you run like Elijah. God is all powerful. He can bring the dead back to life. It doesn't matter how hopeless your situation looks. God can bring it back to life. Considering the different experiences everyone has with God, these experiences give the best explanation of who God is to them. King David explained God to be his provider, his deliverer. That is because of the experiences he has had with God. Hannah described God's greatness in 1 Samuel 2, 1 through 10. Hannah was a woman who had no child. She must have faced a lot of criticism for not being able to give birth, while others were celebrating childbirth. Hannah kept on praying to God, sometimes to know who God truly is to you. You have to be strong and stand in faith. Hannah was strong. She didn't look at the insults of others, but she focused on God. Most Bible characters who explain who God is to them had an experience that must have changed their lives. Are we going to talk about Joshua, who led the children of Israel when he was young, and he won battles? Joshua was able to stop the sun from moving for a whole day. All of these miraculous things would not have been possible without God with them. If all these men and women could stand up today, they would all testify to the fact that without God you can do nothing. If you have been going outside of Christ, if you have been behaving like Christ is not the one helping you, you need to have a rethink. You need to retrace your steps. You need to come back to Christ because without Him, you are nothing. Proverbs 18, 10 KJV the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. Jesus is a place of safety. He is where we need to be. He is the only one who can help us out of any situation. You cannot be safe outside of Christ. You cannot walk freely outside of Christ. This life is full of troubles. It is full of challenges. It is full of chaos. We cannot be safe outside of Christ. Jesus promised you and me peace. He said that even though we face all of these troubles, He will be there for us. John 16, 33, KJV. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Jesus will give you peace. Jesus will give you all that you want. Abide in Christ. That is the surest place to be in the world today. Outside is dangerous. The storm is raging. The devil is going around looking for those that he will destroy. You cannot afford to be outside of Christ. You must dwell in Christ. The devil is going to and fro the earth looking for you. He is looking for me. He wants that person that will come out of Christ. He wants that person that will stop abiding in Christ. He wants to attack people like that. You cannot do anything without Christ. There ain't nothing like God's time. 
When God says it's your time, it is your hour. No demon of hell, no witch of the earth, no human on this planet can stop you. So a word of encouragement for you today, if you have experienced battle after battle after battle, know that something is about to happen for you. If you have experienced struggle after struggle, after struggle, know that something is about to happen for you. But you have to have faith. You need to continue to believe in God. God does everything in his time. What the story of Joseph tells us is that remember when God moves, something can occur in a nanosecond that would take you months or years to accomplish if you could do it at all. He went from a prison to a king. Why? Because his time had come. There are some statements that only certain people can say. Only your mother can say to you, I carried you for nine months. Only Orville Wright could say, I was the first man to fly. Only Usain Bolt can say, I am the fastest man in the world. And we see in the Bible some statements that only God can say. John 11, 25 through 26. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? You and I cannot say any statement like that. What a statement. What a statement. Jesus said anyone who believes in him will not die but live. Many people have read this part and claimed that Jesus was talking about physical death. Jesus was not talking about that kind of death. Believing Jesus means accepting the instructions he has given to those who will choose to follow him. If you are following him, if you follow these instructions, you will escape something called the second death. What kind of death are we talking about? Revelation 21.8 KJV But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Jesus Christ is the living one. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. I am the bread of life. The one coming to me shall never hunger, and the one believing in me never shall thirst at any time. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Everything that lives flows from Jesus Christ. Everything is about him. This whole Bible is about him. You and I were created to know him. And to know the Lord Jesus Christ is to love him. You cannot truly know the Lord Jesus Christ and not love him. He is unique. He is life. He is the heartbeat of every child of God because he is the living one. The Apostle Paul said, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. The Apostle Paul wanted the saints to know to be absent from the body 
is to be present with the Lord. Because of what Christ did on the cross for us, you and I have the assurance of eternal life. And those that die are asleep in Jesus. Jesus is the giver of life. You and I live. We have life in us. There are seven billion people on this earth and they all live. Angels are alive. Cherubims are alive. But there is no one in this universe that has life like the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever. All life comes from him. When we step into eternity, we will meet him. And that is our desire. That is what we hunger and thirst for, to meet him who came to this earth for my sins, to meet him who was born in Bethlehem, to meet him who was laid in a manger, to meet him who performed miracles on earth, to him who cast out devils, to meet him who raised the dead, to meet him who healed the sick, to meet him who opened up blind eyes, to meet him who was wounded for our transgressions, to meet him who was bruised for our iniquities, to meet him who took my sin upon him and died on the cross for me. He was dead and now look, he is alive forever and ever. And he holds the keys of death and Hades. And because he lives, I live. And the Bible tells me that my life is in Christ. What does this tell us? It is talking of the love of God for us. Mankind allowed sin to enter into the world, and death followed. But because God loved us, and he will never stop loving us, he sent Jesus to die for us and give us life. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. God loves you, and he demonstrated his love by rescuing us. Romans 5.8 But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Whilst you were still out in the world, whilst you still were in the world shaking what your mother gave you, whilst you were still dropping it like it's hot, whilst you were busy committing that sin you have no business in committing. God demonstrated his love for you. No one and nothing can separate you from the love of God. No demon can separate you. No angel can separate you from the love of God. Romans 8, 38 through 39 for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. According to Jesus, there is only one thing that you must do to have this victory over the devil and that is you must live and believe in him. When we are talking about living in Christ, it means you must accept everything that he gives you. You must take all his instructions. You must follow his steps. You must wash and follow him. Jesus said this same thing in John 15, 4, that Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, 
except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. The fruit that you will bring forth when you are in Christ is the fruit of life. You cannot live if you are not living in him. When you abide in Christ, there is no way you will not believe him. You will start to do the things he asks you to do. You will start to follow his steps. When you believe in Christ, it means you will believe he died and defeated death, and he has the victory over death. If you accept this and believe it, you will be given that victory too, and you will not face death. Are you living in Christ? Do you believe in him and do the things he has commanded you to do? You cannot say you love Christ and refuse to do the things he has asked you to do. If you do not love him, you will not do the things he asks you to do. And you will not have the access to the victory. You have to believe in Christ. You have to obey Christ. That is the only way you can be safe from death. That is the only way you can avoid the impending destruction that will come through sin. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah 41.10 The God of the Bible is omnipresent. He is present at all times in every space. There is absolutely no place that is void of his presence. The psalm exclaimed that the presence of God is even in the depths of Hades. Those of us who are his children have a greater assurance than just his omnipresence. We are assured of his active or manifested presence. Theologians call this his Shekinah presence. Throughout the Old Testament, we saw Israel experiencing this in supernatural ways. No group of people experienced the glory of God the way the children of Israel did. God went through great supernatural lengths to deliver his people. The waters were turned to blood. Frogs swarmed forth, covering every inch of land and entering houses and bedrooms. Hordes of wild animals destroyed everything in their path. When they came to the banks of the Red Sea, we saw the presence of God parting the waters for them. As they journeyed through the desert on their exodus, we saw his presence manifested as a pillar of cloud by day and pillar of fire by night. God was with the children of Israel. There are many more magnificent manifestations through the scriptures where God was with men and women. The wonderful thing is that even today, God is still with his people. Our Lord Jesus, at the end of the book of Matthew, gave the disciples and us a powerful assurance of the presence of God. As Jesus was ascending, I can just see him tell the disciples and us, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The promise of the presence of God being with us is trustworthy because no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. The penultimate book of the Bible was written by Jude. Several views exist concerning the identity of Jude, but the most commonly held view of his identity identifies him as the brother of James, the same James who wrote the New Testament book of James, James the Just. Both these men were the half-brothers of Jesus Christ. Jude wrote about the judgment of God on the ungodly. He highlighted the fact that God could save and he also reserves the power to destroy those who refuse to believe. The ones that have given themselves up to their sinful desires. Jude quoted Enoch's prophecy 
of what will happen and how it will happen. This is about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, Jude 1 verse 14 to 15 And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints, to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. We need to carefully explore this prophecy of Enoch. God could have placed this prophecy anywhere else in the Bible, but he intentionally placed it in the penultimate book of the Bible. Because in the book of Revelation, Jesus is revealed in a light that is rarely preached these days. Jesus is revealed in a light that a lot of people try to avoid in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is revealed as the judge and king. Let's look at the prophecy of Enoch. It is as if he is getting us ready for the revelation of Jesus Christ in the final book of the Bible. Our image of the Lord Jesus Christ, our image and picture of our Lord Jesus Christ is that which has been painted or put in our minds by his ministry in the Gospels. When he was on this earth, the majority of people's picture of Jesus is made up of the Gospels, where we see Jesus exercising compassion, where we see him as a peaceful savior. But that's not what Enoch showed us. Enoch showed us the second advent of Jesus. Enoch said, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints. When Jesus, when the Lord Jesus returns for his second advent, he will not come as he came the first time. This time, he won't be sleeping in the womb of a virgin and gestating for nine months. This time, he won't be born in a stable and laid in a manger. This time, he won't be baptized in the river Jordan with the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove, Jesus in the water, and the voice of God saying, this is my son. This time, he won't multiply fish and loaves and feed 5,000. This time, he won't be invited to a funeral service and stop it and bring the dead back to life. This time, he won't spit in the eyes of a blind man and allow him to see. This time, he won't make the lame walk and cure a woman with the issue of blood. This time, he won't leave the saints in heaven. This time, he won't leave the innumerable numbers of angels that are in heaven. This time, our Lord will not come alone. What we see in this prophecy is that Jesus is not coming alone in his second advent. We also see this in 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 7 and 8. It says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is also confirmation that Jesus in his second advent, he will not come alone. And he will not come for the same reason he came the first time. The first time he came as a lamb. The second time he will come as the lion of the tribe of Judah. The first time he came in peace. The second time, Enoch tells us that he comes as the judge. You see, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ and before the ascension, Jesus was seen coming and going to different people, appearing to different people. He appeared to Mary Magdalene, then on the road to Emmaus. Then he appeared to the 10 apostles, then to Thomas, then at the Sea of Tiberias, then he ascended into heaven. Indeed, the disciples and the others who were there saw Jesus ascending to heaven in his human nature. 
And then we find that John saw him in Revelation chapter 1 verse 17. He states, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and forever and I hold the keys to death and Hades. We in our human nature cannot stand the glory of Jesus. He is the great I am. He is the almighty God. He says, I am the almighty. I am the self-existing one. The second time Jesus comes, he comes to execute judgment. But that's a message that most people don't want to hear. But the prophet Enoch said that's exactly what he will come to do. This is one of the reasons why the book of Revelation was the most contested book in the Bible. Because Jesus Christ is revealed as the judge and the king. But the principle and the idea of judgment is a belief and a concept that humans have rejected for years. Albeit they believe in earthly judgment and earthly judicial systems and courts and so on. The fact that one day you'll be held accountable, the fact that one day you'll stand before a judge, the fact that one day you'll meet your maker, the fact that Hebrews 9.27 states it clearly for all of us, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this comes judgment. It's just a simple matter of crossing the tide from one side of the bridge to the other and you will stand before him to stand before the judge. This is something that we as humans don't like to accept. But the fact of the matter, my friend, is that you and I will one day stand before our maker and Jesus in the book of Revelation is revealed as the judge. The book of Revelation was the last book to be added in the New Testament. There were so much arguments and debating whether or not this book should be added. Even, listen, even Christian scholars have had negative criticism of this book. One of which states the following about the book of Revelation. This book will either find you mad or leave you mad. This is a Christian scholar speaking about the book of Revelation. Imagine, there are even well-known pastors from the 1800s, from the 1700s, and even from the 1900s, who if I state them by name, you would know them most probably. They in their time completely discarded the book of Revelation, stating it shouldn't be in the Bible. If that isn't pride, I don't know what is. To think you know better than God on what he should or should not include in his word. That right there is the dictionary definition of pride. Enoch saw Jesus will come as judge, but the world wants to reject this truth. And that is why the book of Revelation has been so contested. Charles Lawson explains this perfectly. He stated that there are those who want to keep Jesus as a baby in a manger. They like the boyhood of Christ. There are those who fashion the whole ministry on what he did when he was here on earth and the miracles he performed on the Sea of Galilee and the surrounding areas. There are those who want to keep him on the cross and on the crucifix. And in some strange way, they try to relate their suffering to the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ and somehow or another try to convert their suffering into some kind of righteousness as if they can suffer and that they can create righteousness from their suffering, which is a perversion of the word of God. The truth is, Jesus Christ is no longer a baby. He is no longer walking about the Sea of Galilee performing miracles. He's no longer nailed to a cross. He's no longer in the grave. Death tried to hold him for three days. And Satan and the demons of hell for three days thought they had killed the son of the living God. But on the third day, he rose again and he ascended into heaven. And at a time in human history, Jesus Christ will return for his second advent as the judge. The prophet Enoch told us 
that our Lord Jesus will come to give judgment. His prophecy was placed in the Bible as if he was pointing to us, to the book of Revelation, to what we are about to see about the revelation of Jesus Christ. In the book of Revelation, the Lord Jesus Christ wants his church to know who he is, because the only way to the Father is through him. If come through any other way, you come in as a thief and a robber. The Lord Jesus is revealed in the book of Revelation. He is revealed in Revelation 1 verse 18. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. He is the risen king, the living one. He is no longer coming as a baby. He is no longer on the cross. He is no longer on the grave, but he is the living one who has the keys of death and Hades. He is revealed in Revelation 19 verse 11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge. He is revealed in Revelation 22 verse 13, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end the first and the last. This means it all started with him and it will all consummate with him.